The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, some of those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip then went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, we, we want to tuck ourselves underneath your word today. Lord, we are often looking for so many, so many words elsewhere, sources of hope, sources of encouragement, sources of life. Um, and Lord, there are no words that can give us life but yours. And so God, we just come to you this morning saying we need you. We need you to give us life. We need you to help us understand your word. So would you teach us? Would you lead us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I got to go to a museum a few months ago. I don't know if anybody's ever been to the LACMA Museum. No art fans, that's good. That's good, good for this illustration on art. Great, here we go, awesome. Uh But uh, I went to the LACMA uh, a few months ago and uh, I appreciate art moderately, but there's a certain kind of art that I like just don't understand, and it's modern art. I don't understand modern art at all. It just kind of really confuses me. And if you're an art fan in this room, it sounds like almost none of you, that's good. good. But if you are, I'm really, I, I might offend you with what I'm going to say. Because I, I kind of have this theory about modern art. I don't know if you've seen it before, but I have this theory about modern art that it's basically just childhood art that someone put in a museum. I don't know if you've looked at modern art recently. It looks like children's work. Okay, to me, I'm not an artist, I'm an untrained eye, I have no appreciation for it. It looks like children's art to me. In fact, I grabbed a few photos for you uh, to go through this morning. This is real modern art that was sold for, wait for it, $44 million. Oh, hold on, go back, just go back to that last one for a second. Are you seeing, you see this? Literally a child. $44 million. There we go. Okay, uh, here's another one. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure my toddler did this yesterday. Like, that, this sold for $55 million. This is art. This is in real museums. Go to another one. The next one. Look at that. I mean, this is literally like a child put their hands in paint and just smeared all over the screen, but it sold for $65 million. I don't understand. Or this one. That's literally three, three strokes of paint. It, that looks like a three-year-old did it. And that one actually was done by a three-year-old. This was done by my son a few years ago when he was three years old. But you couldn't tell the difference. You see what I'm saying? That's right. This sold for zero dollars. Priceless. That's the deal. Modern art to me looks like childhood art that was put in a museum. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just, it looks like it's done by children to me. 
But it makes me think this. When I look at modern art, I think if you're going to be a good modern artist, you have to be able to access some part of your childhood imagination that most of us just can't anymore. Right? If, if you and I were given a blank piece of paper, I don't think any of us in this room would come up with that. Because most of us would think, that's not pretty. I can't draw that. I'm not going to submit that because it doesn't look good. No one thinks it looks good. But if you're a modern artist, you access this part of your childhood imagination where you're just like, yes, I see so many things here. It's incredible. Don't you see the house that is right here on this painting? No, you don't see it because you have no imagination, right? This is my theory about, about modern art. Maybe it's insane. Maybe it's offensive. I don't know. But I think that as adults, most of us have learned to kind of put art in a box, right? We think this is art and this is not art. And children don't have those boxes. They just go. And as we grow up, we know this, as adults, we kind of stop imagining, right? We kind of rein things in. We get more realistic. We learn what's considered pretty art. We learn to color in the lines because that's what looks pretty. And we don't even allow ourselves to imagine things like that. And I think in similar ways, many of us have grown accustomed to doing the same thing to God. As we've grown older, we started to shrink God down into some manageable, smaller size with certain categories that he fits in. God does this, these things, but he doesn't do these things. And we don't think that there's any room for him to do things outside of our expectations or outside of our imaginations. And we end up, a lot of us, with a God that agrees with us on everything, never really surprises us, and is fairly boring and predictable. And as we come to John chapter 12, Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem, and he's very close to his resurrection. In fact, it's within about a week Jesus is going to be on the cross. And as he enters into Jerusalem, there's many Jews there celebrating the Passover and they come to greet him with a ton of fanfare. It's a, it's, a, it's a big celebration as Jesus comes in. They're confessing him to be the king of Israel. They felt, I think, this crowd felt that they had a pretty firm idea of who Jesus was, of what he was here to do and what it would look like. They felt like they had a pretty realistic, practical expectation of what the king of Israel, the Messiah, would do. But Jesus doesn't fit in their boxes. He doesn't stay in their nice little categories. Jesus is an unimaginable king. He's a king that, that blows our expectations out of the water, that does things that no one would imagine he could do or would do. He's nothing like they actually expected. And as he comes into Jerusalem, the things that he's going to do after receiving this declaration as king, not one person would have thought that's what he's here to do. He's an unimaginable king. Let's look together at verse 12. It says, The next day that the large crowd had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they grabbed some palm branches and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So it's Passover in Jerusalem, which is a really significant time of year in Jerusalem where everyone would be, would be coming to Jerusalem to worship God, to celebrate the feast of Passover, to celebrate the time when God was leading his people out of Egypt and he provided a way for the wrath of God to pass over his people by the blood of the lamb. If you remember the story in the book of Exodus and God gave his people, celebrate this every year, that through the blood of the lamb, you would be pardoned. You would have your sins passed over and you would be saved. It's meant to point us to Jesus, who is the true Passover lamb, who by having his blood cover us, the wrath of God passes over us and we don't receive it. We're saved from our sins. But everyone's flocking to celebrate Passover. Even the nations are flocking to Jerusalem for Passover. We even see later in, in this story that there's some, some Greeks, which essentially just means um, Greek-speaking Gentiles, non-Jewish people flocking to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. But there's a group of Jews that hears Jesus is coming. And they've heard the stories. They maybe were there to, to witness the resurrection of Lazarus, or maybe they heard about it. And they're, they're here to anoint Jesus as the King of Israel as he comes into Jerusalem. And so they go grab some palm branches, as you would, you know, 
right? When someone comes to town that you think is important, we all go grab our palm branches, right? No, we don't do that. But that was a very significant gesture in this culture. It's not one that was prescribed in the Old Testament for the king of Israel. That, that's not where this context comes from. But it's something that would have immediately been understood by these Jews as a religious symbol of victory and authority. It was, it was symbolic with this, this idea that one day God was going to triumph and set his people free. It also had become over the last few years in between the close of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament, it had become a symbol that became a, somewhat of a national identity for the people of Israel. It, the, the palm branches were, were often used in times of celebration and victory for the nation of Israel. In fact, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, but you know the, the, the celebration of Hanukkah that, we, we, that some of us are familiar with in modern day was a celebration of a victory that happened for the people of Israel in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's called, often referred to as the Maccabean Revolt, where the, the temple had been taken over by non-Jews and it'd be, be set up as, uh, as worship to pagan gods and, and that there was a group of Jews who, who led a revolt to drive them out and take the temple back. Well, when that happened, when that victory happened, they celebrated with palm branches. It became this national identity of victory and triumph over the nations. And so they see King Jesus coming and they think, let's go grab palm branches because he's about to do, he's about to work some victory for national Israel. In fact, along, in, in Jesus' time, there were even these Jewish coins that would circulate that had a palm tree on it. And on these coins with the palm tree, it would say, for the redemption of Zion, which is the name for Jerusalem, for the, for the redemption of Israel. So these palm branches aren't just like, you know, because they were lying around or because it's cute to see kids carrying palm branches. It was like, no, no, no. The king of the Jews is coming. Let's go get the palm branches. Through carrying this symbol, they're communicating their expectations of who Jesus is and what he will do. Right? There's, there's symbols like this even today in our culture. Or you can see someone's actions and interpret them very differently based off of what symbol they're carrying, right? For example, if, if you saw someone running down the street, screaming and shouting, wearing a Lakers jersey, you would think, oh, they're, they're, maybe they're celebrating like that the Lakers won because it's been a long time, right? <laughs> like maybe that's why they're celebrating. That's why they're screaming and yelling. But if, that's, if that, you saw that same exact situation of someone running down the street screaming and yelling, not to go super dark here, but like if someone ran down the street screaming and yelling and they had like a giant swastika on their shirt, you would, you would interpret that radically differently. You would, you would probably be, we'd probably all be afraid. We'd probably be like, like, what's happening? Like we need to get out of here because that symbol that they're bearing communicates their values, communicates their expectations and their hopes. And it tells you how to interpret their actions. Here with the palm branches, it's not just a celebration. They're communicating their values, their hopes, their expectations of this Jesus because of the symbol they're carrying. If that wasn't enough, they're also shouting several things. They're shouting things that come from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 verse 25 says this, Save us, we pray. Could also be translated, Hosanna, we pray. O Lord, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made the light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. As the crowds look at Jesus, they grab these palm branches and they start quoting this old psalm saying, save us. This ad thing addressed to the Lord. They, they turn to their king entering into the city and they're saying, save us. Praise be to you. Blessings on you, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The one that's sent by God to bring salvation. They, they even call him the king of Israel. 
declaring this one that comes in, we, we receive you, we acknowledge you as the king of Israel, the promised king who would come from the line of David and redeem God's people and set them free and establish an everlasting kingdom. They're saying, this guy is it. And these Jewish people had some very clear expectations of Jesus. One is that he would redeem Israel as a whole on a national level, that, that this king coming would redeem Israel. We have a hard time thinking in those nationalistic terms because we are a, a very individualistic society, but the people of Israel, as they watched God work throughout the Old Testament, often his redemption is a national redemption of his people. And it's because the, the people of Israel, uh, all throughout the Old Testament, is a very unique group. It's a chosen nation. It's literally a, a, a people that God created for himself. God didn't look on the nations of the earth and decided, this one's my favorite. No, he started one himself and says, this is my chosen nation. And so we even see carried on into the New Testament, God's people, the church become, we, we get called in the book of 1 Peter, a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So they were expecting that when the king comes, the promised king, he's going to redeem national Israel. All of us together, he's going to restore our identity and our prominence and our individuality as a nation. He's going to subdue our enemies and take out whoever is ruling over us. And so at this time, that's Rome. So as the king comes in, they have their palm branches. Their expectation is Jesus is here to take out Rome and establish Israel once again. That's what they're communicating. They expect Jesus to bring peace and well-being for his people. That's their hope. There are people that long to be free again, that long to, to not have any ounce of oppression over them. And so they see their king and they're filled with hope that he's going to bring peace and well-being for God's people. Give them their land, restore them, liberate them. And so this crowd, in many ways, both with their voices and with their actions, are communicating that Jesus, they're heralding him as the king. And with that comes significant military expectations, hopes of conquest and victory. And we see how Jesus responds. In verse 14, Jesus' response is this, Jesus found a donkey and he sat on it. Just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus' response to this crowd and their expectation is to go find a donkey and sit on it. Now, there's many that will point to this moment and, and, and say something along the lines of this, that Jesus is, is communicating, to, he's trying to temper their, their passion. He's trying to temper them down to make them not so um, filled with gusto and excitement about him being, they're kind of rejecting what, they, what they're expecting. He's kind of rejecting their confession as king by coming in on a donkey instead of on a war horse. And he's trying to kind of tamper down those expectations. But I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Jesus chooses a donkey intentionally. And then the quote right after is from the book of Zechariah, who's a prophet. So it's helpful when, when the New Testament quotes something from the Old Testament, it's helpful for us to go back. Because when, when, when a New Testament author does that, they're expecting you and I to be familiar with that text. So I don't know if you're familiar with Zechariah 9. I'm going to take a stab and say, probably not off the top of your head, at least. So let's go back there and see what it says. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says this. The heading, if you have a Bible with you, says the coming king of Zion. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, which is just the people of Israel. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. Listen to this. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Jesus goes and finds a donkey because he wants to communicate, yes, I am the king and I'm this one in Zechariah chapter 9. I am the king that is coming to redeem my people. I am the humble king coming on a donkey. I am the king who is coming to speak peace to the nations. In this moment, the Jewish people are hoping this king's not coming for peace to the nations. They're hoping this king is coming with a sword drawn towards the nations. Take them out. Wipe them out. Establish national Israel again. Take out the nations because we're the best one. God is simply and only for this nation. Which is honestly for... For those that, that, that claim the name of Jesus, this, this sort of nationalistic identity has even continued on now to, to just replace Israel with the United States. Yes, Jesus, come and return. Take out the other evil nations. Establish your one true nation of the United States, which is just nonsense. That's not biblical. Like, you, like let's talk all day long. Just open the Bible. You will never once see that. Not once. Jesus, this king is coming, and it says he's coming to speak peace to the nations. Because if you read the Old Testament, yes, God has chosen the people of Israel, but he's always had a heart for the nations. Always. One of the very reasons why Israel is chosen, God says, is that you would be my people and show the other nations that I am holy. That through obeying me, the other nations would look on the God of Israel and say, that's the one true God. And throughout the story, we would see non-Jewish people come into the covenant family of God because they said, yes, he is, and come in. In fact, many of them are in the line of Jesus. The lineage of Jesus is filled with a few people that are Gentiles, non-Jews, but confessed, that's the one true God. I'm coming in. God's always had a heart for the nations. That's what we see in the book of Revelation. That around the throne of Jesus, when we enter heaven, will not be one or two nations. It will be every tribe, tongue, language, people group. Every, everyone will be represented because God is a God of the nations. And when the king is coming, he's coming for his people, which will include the nations. If it doesn't, you and I aren't in. He's come to set prisoners free. So here's what I think Jesus is doing as he comes in on this donkey. I think he is very clearly accepting their confession of him as king. Because actually the crowds have a, from their confession, they're having a very biblically accurate response to the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem. They're confessing him to be the promised coming king. They're right. Jesus is not looking at them and saying, no, 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 you're wrong. No, he's receiving it. He's accepting their confession as king. That's what I believe he's doing. But he's going to accomplish what the crowds hoped for. He is. They hoped that this king would bring peace and well-being for God's people. That's exactly what Jesus is going to do. But he's going to do it way differently than they think. Way different. Not one single person here in this moment is thinking, oh yeah, this king's here to come die on a cross and save people from every corner of the earth. No one thought that. They thought he would bring peace and well-being, to which Jesus is saying, yes and amen, I'm doing it but I'm going to do it way differently and way better than you can even imagine. You can't even access a part of your brain that's going to imagine what I'm about to do in Jerusalem. And it's going to be infinitely better than whatever you're expecting. This is what Jesus does. Jesus comes in and does something unimaginable because that's who he is. He's the unimaginable king. I know that some of us in this room probably hate sports, but some of us probably like sports, but you can bear with me real quick on a sports, sports thing. This last weekend, uh, the NFL draft happened, okay? Which if you're a football fan, it's a really big weekend where you just sit and you watch your team pick players that you know nothing about. 
right? And it's really this interesting phenomenon that happens. Um, if you spend any time on Twitter, if you talk to a, a football fan after a football draft and you ask like, hey, how did your team do in the draft? Every single fan has an opinion about how their team did in the draft, even though no one knows anything about these players, right? Because no one watches the college football season all that closely. So all of a sudden, you're getting like 260 players drafted in an NFL draft. I mean, you maybe know like 15 at best, okay? But every single fan of an NFL team has an opinion, not just a, an opinion, but like a strong opinion, and it's really funny to watch. Like if you watch the first round of the NFL draft, you watch these fans that are decked out in their gear. They're at the draft watching people come up to a podium and just read to them who the, the people in the other room that you don't see chose. And people go nuts. They cheer or they boo. And it's just like really interesting to watch. And as a fan of any kind of sports team, you know what the, what the goal is. You know what the what is of your team. Your goal is to win. It's, it's up to the, the people that run the, team, run the team to decide the how of how we're going to accomplish that goal. And every fan, what every fan does, is they're constantly questioning the how. We're all aligned on the what. We as a fan, you as a, the people running the team, we're all in agreement. We want to win. That's the goal. But everyone's got a different opinion or an idea of how we're going to get there. And people will lose their minds over it. And Jesus is coming into to this setting in agreement on the what, on what he is here to do. He is here to redeem. He's here to save. He's here to set prisoners free. He's here to speak peace. He's here to bring well-being for his people. But he doesn't necessarily tell them how he's going to do it. Jesus affirms he's the king. But the how is beyond the understanding of the people. And it really continues for us today. Jesus has revealed to us as his people clearly what his purposes are at all times. You can walk into every situation in your life with 100% certainty and confidence. I know what God is accomplishing through this because he tells us. He tells us, he promises us that he works out everything for two main purposes. One is his glory. His fame, his worship. The other one is for the good of his people. The book of Romans tells us this this promise of God that for those that trust in him, he works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In every single situation, no matter what it is or where it is, God is always 100% committed to that work. That is the what of what he's always aiming for. He is always glorifying his name and he is always working for the good of his people, the true good of his people, right? Does it, it does it, it's not the good that we agree with sometimes, right? Sometimes the good that God's working in our lives is not what we think is good, but he knows it's the true good, right? So he's always doing that. He's told us that. There's, there's no confusion about that. That's really clear. But what Jesus does not always reveal to us clearly is how he's going to accomplish those things. That is often a mystery. Which is why we often feel like, God, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how this is for your glory. I don't understand how this is for my good. I don't get it. It's because God doesn't always show us that. He tells us what he's doing what his purposes are, but he doesn't always show us how it's going to come to happen. And from what we learn about the Lord in the scriptures, God tends to accomplish his purposes in unexpected, unimaginable ways. We could just rifle through a few Old Testament stories to see this is, this is kind of just how God likes to operate. When God established the people of Israel, he came to an old, barren couple and said, I'm going to birth an entire people group that's going to bless everyone on earth through your offspring. Uh, hey, God, we're 90 and 100 and barren. <laughs> Unimaginable ways. That's what God likes to do. How about when he sets Israel free from slavery to Egypt by a series of multiple miraculous plagues? 
No one thought that's what God's going to do, for sure. Like fill the Nile with blood. Yep, I saw that coming, called that. No, it's unimaginable. Or how when, when, when he does set his people free and they come to the Red Sea and they're trapped and they have nowhere to go and the armies of Egypt are pursuing them and it's like, well, we have an ocean in front of us and we have armies behind us. We're done. And God's like, nope, parts the Red Sea for them to walk through. No one thought God's going to do that for sure. It's unimaginable. This is just what God likes to do. Or how when Israel's through in the wilderness and he feeds them by bread falling from the sky for four decades. What? Or all of these victories that you read about that God works for his people through the most ridiculous of strategies, right? Like where instead of fighting, he says, hey, just walk. Just walk around the city and I'll crumble it down. Hey, when I tell you, just blow your instruments really loud or just break some pots on the ground and I'm going to confuse everybody. Like the things that God does, all throughout the Old Testament. He's fulfilling his promises to people. That's not the surprise. But how he does it is unimaginable. And the reason why God's ways are so unimaginable to us, I think is twofold. One, he's so high above us. He can do far more than we ask or imagine. He, he thinks in a way that we, we, we just literally have no access to. We're, we're, we're finite. He's infinite. He's good, we're not. But I think it's also because we think very little of him. We think very little of God. We expect very little of him. But God loves to regularly shatter our categories. He loves to do that. In fact, Ephesians 3 says this, this is part of Paul's prayer for God's people. He's praying for them to have the strength to comprehend and understand the Lord. And then he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. God is always able to do far more than we could possibly ever imagine. And he loves doing that. He loves blowing us away. And by far and away, the most unimaginable, miraculous work that God does is on the cross. Blowing every single story out of the water. We could compile all of our stories in this room of the ways that God has shown up in unimaginable ways. And I think we would have some beautiful testimonies to his goodness. But nothing compares to what Christ did on the cross. It was not even in the realm of the imagination, not just for the crowds, but for the disciples. In fact, look what Jesus says in verse 20. He's just, or verse, uh, where did it go? 24. 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus is, it comes off of this moment of being crowned king and he immediately then goes to the cross, which is not what anyone expected the king to do. No, no, you're here to accomplish victory. You're not here to die. Again, unimaginable ways that Jesus is going to do this stuff. No one thought this. Redemption, yes. Jesus says, yes, I am coming to bring Redemption. Therefore, I must be lifted up and killed. What? No, you, you, you just said redemption. Like what? The way he's going to do this is unimaginable. But Jesus says this, the time has come, the hour has come for me to be glorified. And he's talking about the cross. And that's interesting because we often can think that the cross is like the prelude to the glory. The cross is like, 
the sad moment to the happy moment of the resurrection. Like, the cross is when, we, when we're depressed and we're sad. And then when Sunday, Easter comes, that's when we like rejoice and happy, like the glory of God that he's risen. But Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And when John talks about the hour in the Gospels, it's always referring to the cross. That the cross is the place of glory. The cross is where God is most glorified in Christ's work on the cross. It doesn't wait until the resurrection. In fact, when you read throughout the New Testament and it talks about our salvation, it points back to the cross. Yes, the resurrection, of course, was necessary. Without it, it would, the cross would have been meaningless. But the cross is the place of glory. It's what Jesus is saying right here. The cross is where we see that Jesus is like nobody else, that he is the king, but he's gentle. The cross is where we see that Jesus is just, and yet he's kind. That he's righteous, and yet he's forgiving. That he's all-powerful, and yet he's sacrificial. That he's just, and yet he's the justifier. That he's the author of life, and yet he dies. The cross is the place of glory. It's the place that we look at and say, man, there's no one, no one on the face of the earth that is like this Jesus because of the cross. And so when Jesus comes in to be anointed as king, he receives it. He says, I am gonna bring peace. I am gonna be, bring redemption, but it's gonna be through a way that none of you understand. But when you do see it, it's gonna be the most glorious, beautiful thing you've ever seen because you're gonna see me in a way you've never seen me before. It's the way the, the scriptures talk about the cross. Look at just a couple of examples here. Colossians chapter two, verse 13 says this, you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our trespasses. How did he do that? Next verse, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The cross was where he accomplished that. The cross is where he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Or in Revelation, when we gather around the throne of Jesus to worship him, this is what we will worship him for. Then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who what? Was slain. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. When we get to heaven to worship Jesus, we will worship him for the cross, for being the lamb that was slain. The cross is the place of glory forever and ever and ever. There's, there's nothing else you and I need to find assurance that God loves us, to find assurance that he is for his people, to find assurance that he will provide for you. The cross is enough. It is the place of ultimate glory. It's what we're saved by. For all who believe, we are saved by a dying man on a cross, not by a military conquest, not by presidential power, not by force or by might, but by the Son of God giving up his life for us on a cross. And the disciples tells us in John 12, they did not understand what Jesus was doing until after he was glorified. So even the disciples sitting here and watching this all happen, they didn't understand until they could see the cross. They didn't understand what Jesus was calling them to until they saw the cross. They don't understand what Jesus is saying when he says to them, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus, what the heck are you saying? What do you mean that whoever loves his life will lose it, but whoever hates his life will keep it for eternal life? We have no idea what you mean. 
they didn't understand it until they saw the cross. That Jesus was calling all of us to follow after him. That he was calling all of us to die with him, to die to ourselves. That death was necessary for fruit to come. Jesus is saying, unless I die, none of you get to be saved. But if I die, it will, my death will bear much fruit. And he calls us to follow him in that way. Jesus is not just an unimaginable king. He's also the unimaginable king who calls us to follow him in those unimaginable ways. To, to, to replicate, to, to follow him in the, the, this idea of, of dying to ourselves so that much fruit could be brought. He calls us to die, to surrender, to lose our lives. This is why the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The essence of coming to follow Jesus is saying, I hate my life. Not in the sense that like you just walk around all mopey and sad, but no, like everything, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. I'll, I'll walk away from everything to have him. And so in that sense, I'll hate my life. And by hating it, I'll gain it forever. I'll keep it forever. I'll be saved. As a follower of Jesus, he's calling us to forfeit our personal dreams. To lay down our goals and our, our dreams for the sake of Christ. To lay those things at his feet. To die regularly in following him. And he says that as we do that, things will happen that you couldn't possibly imagine because to your brain, death sounds like death. It sounds like loss. But when you trust me and you follow me and you look to the cross, you see that death actually bears much fruit. There's a book I read a couple years ago that used this illustration. I'll read it. It says this. Farmers in Oklahoma during the late 1930s faced an excruciating choice. Throughout the earlier decade, rain had been plentiful and the harvests abundant, and many city workers had left their factory jobs for a chance of a fortune in the great American Midwest. The stock market crash of 1929 motivated even more to take the journey west, but in 1931, all the rains stopped. To make matters worse, years of poor farming techniques had destroyed the grasses that preserved moisture during the times of drought. The dry ground resulted in massive dust storms which destroyed remaining fields. Fortunes were swept away in the clouds of terrifying dull gray blizzards. By the fall of 1939, thousands of farmers returned empty-handed to the East Coast. Some that remained faced an excruciating choice. They had just enough grain to feed themselves and their families for one more year. But probably not much longer than that. If they planted these seeds and no rains came, their families would not survive the year. But if they held on to these seeds, grinding them into flour for bread, they forfeited any chance of receiving back a harvest. Many planted in faith, in hope that rain would come. In the fall of 1939, it did. Planting always involves risk. We release control of something we need in the hopes that it will come back to us in multiplied measure. But once we let go of it, we forfeit any ability to use it for ourselves. The seeds you plant, you can no longer consume. Yet, without the act of planting, there will never be a harvest. In the same way God grows his kingdom, only as we take our hands off of what little portion he's given to us, die to our control of it, and plant it into the world. And that feels just as scary to us as those farmers planting their precious remaining seed in the dusty plains of Oklahoma and praying for rain. Jesus is calling us to that kind of life, to live for his glory and not ours, to make decisions based on his plan and not ours. He calls us to things like consider others more important than yourself. Don't, he, he calls us to not hitch his name onto our agendas and just say, yep, God's for this clearly because it's what I want. He calls us to crucify our fleshly desires, to obey God and not man, to submit to his word and not to our own compass, to give generously and to not hide our sins, but expose them to the light. 
He calls us to all these things and he says, you want to see God do unimaginable things? This is the road. And we say, how in the world is that the way to glory? How in the world is that the road to my good? And we're confused. Just like the disciples were until they saw the cross. And the call for us this morning is the same. How in the world is that the way? Look at the cross. It's how we were saved. So even today, we, have, we often have a prescribed, expected way that Jesus will work in our lives. We have an idea of, of this is the kind of things he will do and these are the kinds of things that surely he would never do. And the way we expect Jesus to work, it, it almost never involves loss or sacrifice or suffering. It almost always, though, involves increase, gain, Comfort, increase. But when we look to the cross, we see that it's by dying that much fruit is born. In that verse that I read in Ephesians chapter three that talks about how God is able to do far more than we could ask or imagine, it says that he does those unimaginable things that we could, far beyond all we could ask or imagine, through the power at work in us. So it's not just like that God out there has all this power to do these unimaginable things. He's actually saying that that God that we read about all throughout the scriptures, he's working that power in us, in our lives, in our stories, in our relationships, in our workplaces, in us. And when we look to the cross, we see the way, we see the road. We understand, we can see the character of Christ. We can see that the cross is the glory. We see this upside down nature of God's economy and his kingdom, that losing life is finding it, that hating our lives is keeping it, that to pick up our cross is to, is to receive a crown. We understand when we look to the cross that to repent of our wickedness is the way that we receive righteousness, that dying to ourselves is the way to find life, that to lose here is to gain elsewhere. That to count everything as loss is to gain something of surpassing value. We only believe that and understand that when we look to the cross. Because that's where it's displayed. That's where our salvation lies. And when we see it, we too can follow. We too can follow Christ in dying. We too can get run over for the sake of the gospel. We too can get wronged. We too can get mistreated. We can lose. We can suffer if that's what God has for us. When we look to the cross, we're assured of this, that as Christians, we don't always have to be demanding our share, our portion, our rights. We don't always have to be so concerned with that. We can actually lay those things down for the sake of Christ's name. Because in Christ, we already have everything we need. We've been called to a life of laying ourselves down. So a couple questions for us as we close. Whose kingdom are we about? You see, this crowd had these palm branches. They're saying Hosanna. They're saying Jesus is the king, but the king on their agenda. Are you, are you saying Hosanna to Jesus on, on his agenda or yours? Yeah, yeah, Jesus, you, you can do your power, your mighty works, your salvation stuff on my timeline, on my agenda in ways that I want. Or is it, no, no, it's on your agenda, Jesus, even if it makes no sense to me. What are we doing with what God has given us? If you looked at everything that you had as this, this metaphor of seeds, the, these kingdom seeds, how many of them are you planting in the fields of God's kingdom? And how many of them are you just keeping in your storehouses as food? 
How much of what God is giving you are you just trying to preserve for yourself rather than opening up your hands, letting those things die and bear much fruit in God's kingdom? God can do some pretty unimaginable things. The question is, do we want to see him do those things? God is no different of a God than he has been all throughout the scriptures. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has the same power as he did when he opened the Red Sea. He is still the same kind and gentle and powerful Jesus as he was on the cross. The question is, do we, do we want to see God continue to, to be the miraculous, unimaginable, powerful, glorious king that he is? If we do, he's given us the way to trust him, to die to ourselves and see he's way better than we could ever possibly imagine. And he just gets better and better and better the more we trust him. I'm, it's like, I remember as a kid having steak for the very first time. It was like a glorious experience. I was like, what is this food? And why have I not had it until now? It's amazing. And then I went to Sizzler for the first time as a kid. And then I was like, okay, this is the best steak in the world. <laughs> Everyone needs to come to Sizzler. You don't understand, this place is incredible, right? And I just imagined that like my parents were probably like, oh, just you wait. You have no idea how much better it gets than Sizzler. And I'm telling you right now, I'm in, my, I'm in my 30s. Steak keeps getting better and better and better. I keep discovering these new ways to have it. I've just been told, uh, I've just been enlightened about dry-aged steak, which I've yet to have yet, but I'm so excited. And it just feels like, man, the more, the more you can dive into the realm of steak, you just discover it gets better and better and better, but you, you, you need more money to make it better, 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 right? <laughs> That's the problem. And it, it, I mean, it's so similar with the Lord. He's so good. But he's so much better than we can possibly imagine. And the more that we follow him, the more that we trust in him, the more that we die, the more that we give stuff up and trust him and let him work, we will taste and see that he's good. And he's even more good. And he's even more good. And I'll, I'll, I look back on myself years earlier and I think, man, you thought, you thought Jesus was good then? Look at how good he is now if we trust him. Let's pray together.